organization. It is a registered charitable organization based out of Mumbai. We have been working at the forefront of several causes, including health and hygiene, youth leadership and awareness, uh, uh, civic activism, as well as environment conservation. In the past, we have received, uh, you know, certain accolades for our innovative campaigns, including menstruation festival that we came up with, which is called Masika Mohotsav. Masika Mohotsav has been internationally recognized menstruation festival, which indigenously started in Mumbai. It is being celebrated by several other NGOs in different countries. We have been a part of several environment campaigns, uh, including Save RA. In the MMR region, uh, different projects, including Metro 4. Uh, we have been trying to create an army of critical young thinkers. And with this, uh, I would like to welcome all of you all for this uh, session. And I'm personally really looking forward to it. Uh, over to you, Amrita. Thank you. Organization set up under the aegis of Enviro Legal Defense Farm. Foundation was registered in 2004. The foundation is the research and training arm of the legal firm. Many litigants do not have access to all the required information. The foundation is more proactive in research and policy work. They create a strategic partnership with the litigants. Sanjay Upadhyay is the founder and managing partner of ELDF. He will help us to understand draft EIA notification 2020 so that citizens can actively participate in the process of sending suggestions and objections in large numbers. Sanjay has been practicing environment and development law since 1993. He is an India visiting fellow in Bolt Hall School of Law, University of California, and a global fellow in Marine Policy at Duke University, North Carolina. Sanjay started his career with WWF. Sanjay started his career with WWF. He has served as an environment and development law practitioner to well-known international, national, and state institutions, including World Bank, Asian Development Bank, International Union for Conservation of Nature, International Union for Environment and Development, to name a few. Sanjay has been in the drafting committee of several laws in India and abroad, which includes Wildlife Act, Forest Right Act, Nagaland Biodiversity Rule, Medicine Plant Policy of Arunachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand, and more recently, Forest Act of India. Sanjay practices in the Supreme Court of India and National Green Tribunal. This webinar will have a 40 minutes presentation by Sanjay and then he will answer questions. We will take these questions in chronological uh, order. If we are unable to address all the questions because of restriction of time, then we will collate all the questions and the answers and email it to the participants. Thank you, Sanjay, for giving us your time. Over to you, Sanjay. Thank you, uh, Amrita, and thank you, Nishant. Uh, I see a huge number of uh, uh, familiar faces. Uh, I'm really grateful, uh, first of all, to uh, Amrita, Nishant, and Hema for uh, organizing this uh, webinar. I'm new to this. This is my first, so I hope it's worth it. Uh, there are a lot of distinguished audience out there uh, who, uh, whom, whom I have a lot of regard for, and I'm sure they are going to watch me very carefully and critically as to what I have to say today. Um, as uh, Amrita has said, I'm going to speak for about 35, 40 minutes, and then maybe 10, 15 minutes for uh, uh, queries. Uh, the assumption here is uh, that uh, there are a mixed audience of, of uh, uh, students, uh, experts, and lawyers who, who can also be experts. And uh, so my attempt would be to give a brief overview of what EIA uh, is, the Environment Impact Assessment Notification, uh, uh, which is now in a draft form, has been unleashed. Uh, 
uh, and and some of our thoughts which i'll share uh, hopefully with all of you and then uh, maybe in the future uh, to take it forward uh, to to the to the concerned people who take decisions so i have a little presentation so i'm going to go straight away to the presentation uh, i hope you can see this uh, so i'm going to very quickly go through the the my presentation uh, starting from uh, uh, the journey itself and then getting into the meat of what this draft uh, is supposed to say and uh, some of our thoughts which uh, hopefully uh, will be useful uh, for those who are not so initiated uh, in terms of the eia process uh, environment impact assessment uh, uh so i was i was very quickly so what is yeah. eia is uh, basically integrating environmental yeah, still, concerns yeah. in the developmental activities in its initiation uh, stage and further basically integrating the environmental concerns and you know the what? mitigation measures in the project development so that's the basic mm -hmm. concept if you look at the framework then of course screening scoping consideration of alternatives baseline data collection impact predictions assessment of alternatives delineation of mitigation measures uh so i was coming to the journey uh, so how did it start as we all know uh, the journey of eia started uh, from 1994 uh, a list of 29 industries in the beginning later 32 industries and then 34 basically the whole journey started actually with my environmental career in 1994 itself uh and uh, if you look at the the initial uh, uh framework it was a very simple list of industries which had to be looked into from the environmental standpoint and you can imagine these were the years when environmentalism or environmental movements were beginning to uh, gain currency so that's how it started in 1994 but what is interesting is is the fickleness of the instrument itself and i'm using the word very uh, carefully if you look at the way environment impact assessment notification has been tweaked or amended it's a very interesting story by itself so eia 1994 was amended about 12 times and about four more gazette notifications in 12 years and thereafter the eia 2006 uh went through 39 amendments along with 10 other gazette notification and orders in 14 years and about 348 office memos and clarifications and it is still counting so you can imagine that the instrument itself has become very very uh, i would say uh, complicated i don't know how many of you are aware of these 348 oms that have been issued or the 39 amendments how they have gone about so it's it's become a pretty complex instrument uh, if you like now if you if you see the way it has been amended from 94 to 2006 for example you will see a trend here a lot of public hearing getting exempted uh, exemptions to uh, bulk drugs and pharmaceuticals you will see exemptions on based on pecuniary considerations you will see modernization projects in irrigation again getting exempted uh, when you look at uh, public hearings uh, for offshore exploration etc etc so there has been a series of exemptions so in a sense you get a sense that most of these strict norms are getting diluted and that's uh, saying it very softly if you look at uh, finally the eia 2006 which was again based on uh, a number of consultations etc uh, the main messages that were given to us was that there is a decentralization process uh, of decision making now which will be in place Uh, the categorization of projects again a b b1 b2 etc and about four phases of screening so this was the 2006 uh, uh, highlights if you like uh, if you look at the ei 2006 highlights you will find the concept of pre feasibility report coming in the concept of conceptual plan uh, coming in for construction projects uh, public consultation getting a little more uh, diverse uh, but concepts of uh, uh, terms like plausible stake uh, exemptions coming in a big way for what is called as b2 projects uh, then of course 
draft uh, EIA EMP post public consultation. What is the mechanism? Due diligence for expansion, transfer of the environment clearance itself. Uh, what happens to projects which are within three, uh, 10 kilometers of a protected area or other critically uh, polluted areas, conditions around that, and so on and so forth. It's more of a box ticking approach, if you like. Uh, that's what uh, is being uh, doled out. Uh, NOC's uh, consent, public hearing, it's a, it's a very box ticking sort of an approach. Uh, pecuniary criteria earlier was whether it was enough or not, that has changed. Uh, does size warrant exemption? Uh, public consultation and the method of public consultation and public consent, again, is a huge area of debate uh, that really uh, uh, has to be sorted out. Uh, so in that background, uh, if you look at the kind of conflicts that have emerged, you know, whether it is right of way versus right of environment versus right of livelihoods, uh, the recent debates on uh, linear projects uh, and, and environmental clearance associated with that, uh, a lot of infrastructure development in, in terms of uh, special economic zones and whether they are land grabs or not. Uh, that again, uh, being exempted from the public uh, consultation standpoint, external aid and environmental safeguards is another big debate uh, because we are still sort of struggling that if, if there are projects uh, which have external aid, then of course environmental assessments are at least deemed to be more serious than others. Uh, hydropower projects, again, a big bone of contention. Uh, when does it become run of the river projects? Is it really environment friendly? Are we really talking about cumulative impacts of uh, a series of hydropower projects, uh, whether the river basin approach, et cetera, has been ingrained in the current framework? Do individuals, uh, individual EIAs suffice? Whole RE development, especially solar development, if you see, uh, there's an assumption that it is environment friendly. Uh, there are enough scientific uh, finding that not all solar development in terms of its impact is environment friendly. Uh, today, we are talking about metros, flyovers, airports. There are huge debates around uh, these infrastructure developments and EIA, and some of which is now getting reflected in the new notification, which I'm going to discuss. Uh, if you look at the role of the courts, and uh, it's very interesting because uh, being a lawyer, you face it every day almost. There's a clear trend that emerges that there is a lot of focus on micro issues, uh, you know, uh, somebody's polluted a little, somebody's done this. So there's a lot of hue and cry about those issues. There are a lot of orders, etc. But when it comes to big projects, when it comes to large infrastructure projects, normally the trend is to, to make that policy argument that you know, this is a matter of policy and you have to balance the environment and development debate. And mostly it is in the favor of the infrastructure, the development projects. Uh, I think that's a uh, a cause of concern because uh, we need to really seriously look at these infrastructure projects and how they are unfolding. And uh, 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 sort of a lip service on environment is not going to really help is my understanding. The other of course issue is how do you really monitor these plethora of court orders and the NGT orders that are coming in? And how do you see that on the ground? Because that itself is, 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 uh, is quite a, a serious issue. Uh, if you look at, uh, uh, let's say, the new notification, and this is where the meat starts. Uh, uh, and uh, this is a preliminary view that uh, we have, and my team has worked on uh, quite diligently to understand what is this new uh, draft DIA notification? There's been so much of talk about uh, what should be there and what is the problem with it. Uh, and so, so I'm just sharing my uh, views on it and hopefully it will make sense. Uh, very quickly, if you look at the uh, objectives, you know, any objective of any instrument ideally is very laudable. This is no exception. You will find that uh, it, is, it is for transparent and expedient processes. It is for rationalization, standardization. They have taken note of the violations, what happens to violations that are detected during the course of appraisal, et cetera. How do you deal with that? Uh, environmental clearance has to be examined on merits. Uh, you have to strengthen the monitoring mechanism. So if you look at the objectives, you really can't complain much uh, because uh, except for violations, because that is a bit technical and I'm going to come 
to that a little later. Uh, but I think, as I said, uh, as I understand, God is in details and so is the devil. So the most striking feature that comes out very clearly is that this is framed like a legislation. It is framed like an act. Uh, but as you know, notifications are not acts and they are subordinate legislation. So it is feigning as a legislation uh, like an act, but it is not. So uh, the, the design behind it has to be understood. In my little understanding, uh, after 26 years of EIA notification, I think it's high time to have a law. Why only a notification? But there's a design to it. And we have to understand that design. What is important that unlike the previous 2006 notification, there is no linkage to the environmental policy. The national environmental policy's linkage is, is not there uh, as far as the draft uh, notification is concerned. Uh, very interestingly, this entire draft talks about uh, definitions. A lot of definitions have come in. Uh, the assumption, of course, is to make the entire instrument a little more clear. And this is where uh, I see a bit of a uh, issue on some of these uh, terms, which I'm going to very quickly go through. If you look at the term, for example, uh, first of all, uh, accredited consultants and functional area experts have been included. But if you look at the term appraisal itself, it limits itself to scrutiny of documents. Uh, so it is good to define something, but do you want to limit that definition? That's my first point on the question of appraisal itself, on the definition of appraisal itself. I think there has to be a clause which says that, you know, every other mechanism to appraise uh, in terms of information, in terms of other literature has to come in and not just the document that a project proponent really gives you. Uh, then there's a talk about baseline data. It says pre-project, uh, how pre it can be. Uh, later when you come to the notification, it says not later than three years. So there's again, we need to understand what is this baseline data we are talking about, and there has to be a clarity on that. Uh, then uh, comes the whole issue of border areas. And of course, most defense projects and other infrastructure projects in border areas have been exempted, uh, so to speak, uh, from uh, detailed assessment, if you like. But uh, in, in my understanding, local views have to be integrated somehow, uh, even if the projects are strategic. Uh, there are people, if you're talking about 100 kilometers aerial distance from the line of actual control, then uh, there are a lot of people who reside there and their views have to be integrated. Uh, then there are definitions about capital dredging and maintenance dredging. But I think the most important part is this category of projects. And this is where I have not understood uh, what is the real basis of category of projects. I'm going to deal with this a little more uh, but just for a quick, uh, this thing, it is A, B1, B2, et cetera. But I'm going to come back to this category of projects because I think there are some serious issues related to categorization and whether it is necessary at all. Then, of course, there are concepts of corporate environmental responsibilities that was earlier there in the office memos that have been in, included. Uh, uh, then, uh, very interestingly, there is a concept of expansion and concept of modernization. So when a project is expanded or modernized, then there's a distinction made in this notification. Uh, again, I'm going to deal with it a little more. Uh, general conditions have been brought back, which essentially means that uh, if there are projects close to a protected area or critically polluted area or national highways, et cetera, they are supposed to be evaluated at the center. Now there is this big assumption that anything which comes to the center is more rigorous than what is uh, evaluated at the state level. And this is where I think uh, there is a problem uh, in my understanding. Uh, then there's uh, talk about uh, notified industrial estates. And there's an assumption that all industrial state and estates in this country have prior environmental clearance. My experience shows that there are many which have not, so one needs to really look into that. Uh, then, of course, a very interesting distinction has been made between prior environmental clearance conditions and prior environment permissions. Uh, I'm gonna deal with it a little more earlier, uh, later. Uh, if you look at the next definition, which is public consultation, and I think most of us uh, need to be very, very concerned about this particular definition, which in my humble view is very generic in nature. I don't think it really spells out uh, as a concept. Uh, there is, of course, a detailed process, et cetera, later on. But uh, as, a, as a concept itself, 
it is very generic it's basically integrating somebody's views but how and and the content of it uh, is really is is uh, wanting in my understanding then there's an introduction of violation violation cases versus non compliance cases now in my understanding there is a lot of overlap and possible contradiction uh, as far as these two terms are concerned i'm going to deal with uh, deal with it a little later uh, then uh, so so having seen a bit of definition definitional issues let me just come straight to uh, some of these uh, key features and what are the issues that we think are important to be flagged one thing that i said earlier the distinguishing feature of this prior environmental clearance versus prior environment per, environment permissions uh, needs to be really flagged uh, because their method of approval and the authorities who are looking at it are different uh, for example uh, b2 projects uh, uh, do not go to the appraisal stage uh, there is no public consultation for b2 projects uh, uh, and uh, for environment per permission you don't need to go to the appraisal stage uh the concept of this environment permission itself is prospective so we don't know that if current projects if they are in the domain of environment permission then how do you deal with that that's again not very clear uh if you look at uh, uh land leveling it is allowed uh, in 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 construction projects so you can actually start land leveling and do only if the trees are there you have to be careful uh, as if the land diversity or land as an ecosystem itself is not really an issue you can start land leveling anywhere if you have a construction project and that is not within the within the purview of the uh, eia framework i think that's a that's a little bit of a problem but uh, coming back to the categorization of projects and i think this is where the meat of this presentation is that it is supposed to be based on social environmental and spatial uh, extent so that is the basis which the the law talks about Uh, so there is an assumption in if i have to understand this notification clearly there is an assumption that this exercise has been done already that these categorizations you have based it on social issues on environmental issues on spatial context but where is that we have we don't know what this uh, where is the basis of this presumption we don't know because if you look at the list of projects that are there the distinction criteria is largely on quantum on quantity on capacity on area and it it ends there where is the environmental science where is the environmental potential impact where the environmental impact as a criteria those those uh, concepts are missing if you look at it is primarily on the quantity of production or the area or the capacity it ends there so i think there is a huge issue here in terms of categorization of projects now if you look at the categorization itself it's a bit confusing uh we took some time to understand there is a project which goes to the moe there is a b1 project which does not attract gc uh, then it will go to cr then there is a b1 project if it attracts the general condition it comes back to moe but the category will not change if you then there is a b2 category which uh, requires appraisal and then there is a b2 category uh, which does not require uh, which is uh, of course for environment permission so there are almost uh, uh, five or six categories that you see uh, of projects that are uh, there uh, a bit confusing to say the least uh, then of course national defense projects and strategic they have been exempted uh, in in a way uh, there is a lot of silence around it uh, but uh, the eac will know about it the cr will know about it the ciac will know about it the tr will know about it the diac will know all these acronyms i'm sure you are familiar with is appraisal committees impact assessment authorities Uh, at the central state and the district level uh, but then how do you integrate local concerns as i said earlier is is a key question now very interestingly and this is the point which i want to thank uh, even dr ajay desh pande who sent me a little note from iit mumbai uh, talking about the authorities and the capacity of authorities and the eligibility of these authorities so if you look at the qualifications they are supposed to be post graduate science people of eminence they are supposed to be Uh, the chairpersons or chairman of of these committees now i am pretty intrigued by this word eminence uh, what kind of eminence i mean are we saying that there'll be uh, you know five star eminence for eac and a three star eminence for cr and a single star for ciac 
So this eminence itself determines who will be a chairperson. And there is absolutely no uh, qualification as to what that means uh, in terms of uh, uh, the authorities. But, but largely, if you see the qualifications, there is no difference. All the persons who are assessing the projects, they are not different in terms of qualification. So what is the real basis of qualification? This is absolutely unknown. So I cannot assume even for a moment that people who are at the state level are less intelligent than people who are at the center or at the district for that matter, because you can get people of all qualities and good qualities everywhere. So if the quality of people assessing the instrument, assessing the project is not different, then where is the logic of having this entire classification? So that needs to needs a real uh, relook. Now, if you look at the notification, there's a concept of technical expert committee. It's a statutory committee for the first time being thought through in this notification, which has to go and relook at the categorization process or recategorization of projects based on scientific principles, including on streamlining or procedure. So if you are now putting a technical expert committee, which looks really powerful and you know with a lot of powers, etc., under the Environment Protection Act, then why this was not done in the existing notification? I mean, I don't understand that. Are we going to now relook at every category because of this new technical expert committee after the notification is finalized? In my humble understanding, this should have been done in the EIA notification itself, the current EIA notification. Put this technical expert committee, it's a statutory body which will be accountable to the whole country. Let them recategorize and categorize based on scientific principles. And then we will have an opportunity to look at it legally as well. So I think this is the point which uh, I really want to uh, sort of uh, drive on. And I'll be open to questions later. If you look at the stages, of course, uh, there are again six stages, three stages, and two stages for, for three different types of projects. Category A and B1 have six stages. Now they talk about preparation of final EA, but they don't talk about EMP separately. Of course, if you look at the EIA framework, there's a little environment management plan in between. If you look at the uh, stages of B2 projects, so there's a concept of environment management plan, but there's no concept of what is going to be managed. There's a little section on impact predictions, impact assessment. So I think any impact assessment or its management, they are two essential sides of the same coin. You cannot have an impact report there separately from an environment management plan separately. They are integrated. Unless you study the impact, you cannot have a management of that impact. So this artificial classification of only EMP and appraisal or only EMP and verification, this does not make sense. Because unless you know the real impact of any project at any level of any scale, you cannot have a proper EMP. So I think this is where we need to really put our heads down to understand this notification very carefully. If you look at the responsibility of the project proponent or the consultant, so there is a responsibility that is associated with them, whether it becomes a liability or not needs to be again understood. Uh, and it is there only for the third stage, for some reason. It is only there for the third stage of environment permission. In my understanding, this should be for all the EMPs made but at least the way it is drafted, it doesn't become very clear. I just wanted to flag that point as well. Now, if you look at the, the process of, of uh, application, etc., uh, you'll find that uh, the terms of reference, uh, again, there's a distinction that you don't have to give it to the appraisal committee. Some projects are exempted from that. Uh, the validity of these terms of reference are four years for uh, most projects and five years for hydro projects. I don't know why, why that distinction comes in, but there's a whole process of application, which is there. There's a whole process of preparation of environment impact assessment report. Now, again, this is, this is something that I want to ponder a bit. Uh, the baseline assumptions are on existing manuals. So I think there's a lot of uh, conversation that needs to happen on what are the baseline assumptions and whether the existing manuals are updated uh, to really look into this new notification. Uh, we are talking about only one seasonal data. Now, this is, this is a problem in many ways, except for River Valley Project, which is for one year. 
uh, one season data in my little understanding of science does not give you the real picture of environmental impact and i think this needs to be debated more uh, and consulted more uh, experts will tell you more but at least this is my understanding uh, why no uh, uh, why uh, emp only for b2 projects we we don't understand that the point i have made earlier that eia and emp has to be integrated they are they are sides of the same uh, two sides of the same coin uh, that again needs to be looked into um then if you if you come to public consultation and i really want to spend some time on this i hope i have time um but uh, very importantly the information that you are providing to the people at large is very limited a summary report you know maybe two three pages does not give you anything about the project really of course there is a provision of draft eia report that can be requested uh, on a written request but you know why can't we actually give this information out there where is the problem uh, why be so secretive about it uh, there is no clarity for example on adjoining district of a different state if it is impacted and i know many cases where we have thought that the the downstream states do have problems and how do you really integrate that there are possible in, impacts there that is missing in the public consultation process as such it's not really clear uh, objections by people in writing has to have only by those who have plausible stake now what is that what does that mean i have been on the other side and i have seen many public comments coming to government bodies where i have been part of drafting committees and i have seen that unless you make it a little mandatory this plausible stake term can take most comments out of the window and i think we need to be really careful about that then there is a provision of public consultation by any other appropriate method now i really don't know what that means uh, what is this any other appropriate mode we need to clarify uh, another very interesting provision is public consultation is required only if the expansion or modernization is more than 50% so if i have a project of x unless i am more than 50% there is no need for public consultation so if i am 49% believe you me most of the projects will be 49% expansion here and here, here onwards then i am not required for uh, there is no requirement for public consultation i think we need to really understand this logic and this goes absolutely in the face of several supreme court judgments including the latest uh, if you look at uh, keystone realtors judgment of justice chandrachur you will find that this whole marginal expansion also requires a relook and and public consultation uh, if you want to do away with that then there is a serious issue here in my understanding there is again exemption to notified estates uh, i think that needs to be questioned in my humble understanding uh, all building projects construction projects town area development flyovers elevated roads bridges they have been exempted from public hearing i don't know why i think they do have impact they have huge impact area development especially flyovers elevated road bridges on on critical rivers i think we need to really look into this and why public consultation should be avoided then there is an option of no public hearing also of course this was there in the earlier notification also there is a possibility of another public agency coming in who are not subordinate to this regulatory authority which conducts the public hearing and then they are supposed to conduct it and if they don't then there is a possibility of laying down reasons of why you cannot or why you have to dispense with public hearing i can understand that there are areas which are very very uh, sensitive where it is not possible but by and large this cannot be uh, cannot be there as a provision it can only be a little exception somewhere on extreme circumstances it cannot be an option given uh, in the notification uh, linear projects again in border areas as i have said is exempted but i think it's important that the concerns of the local people who are there within those 100 kilometers from the line of actual control their concerns have to be integrated somehow uh, if not a public hearing some mechanism has to be there earlier in the notification you will find that there was a proper supplementary report which used to address the public concerns and it was mandatory for the project proponent to include all those concerns in the ei report i think that is missing now although there is a wording which says that you can uh, uh, take the concerns and fill it up in the eia or the emp report but this separate report used to be uh, far more easy 
and understandable that these are the people's concerns and they've, whether they've been addressed or not. So that is something that needs to be looked into. Now, if you uh, come back to the appraisal process, very quickly, there's a scrutiny, there's an actual appraisal, there's a recommendation, and the project proponents can also come in. Uh, you don't have to really uh, give another fresh study. That's not a norm. It's only an exception. And then the competent authority has to take a decision in 15 days. Now, if they don't take a decision, there's nothing called deemed provision anymore. So that is largely the appraisal process that we have. Uh, if you look at uh, the, the whole debate about the procedure for granting environmental clearance for modernization, there's a whole section on this. I'm not going to deal with it at the moment because there's a lack of time. But what is important is that there is no distinction between modernization and expansion as far as this procedure is concerned. In fact, it has been watered down to a certain extent, I would say, uh, on modernization. And they have made slabs where you can actually get, uh, you know, very few documents you can get your modernization project through. I think this needs a, a bit of a relook, uh, I would say. The certificate from the pollution board and the technical committee which gives that certificate, again, very little information on how this will work and uh, how it will be obtained. That's something that needs to be looked into as well. Uh, if you look at the, the granting or the rejection of, of, of clearance, uh, there is a concept of deemed approval. Uh, if the authority gives it back to the appraisal committee and they give it back and the authority does not give their view in, in 45 days, et cetera, then there is a deemed approval provision. But if they don't give it in the initial period, there is no clarity as far as the instrument goes. Uh, then this entire environmental clearance has been linked with other instruments. For example, the forest clearance stage one, the preliminary notification of land acquisition, the, the coastal regulation zone notification, the letter of intent of mining, et cetera, et cetera. So there is now a linkage between other instruments, uh, and there have been views on that as well. That is important. The consultants uh, and the, and, and if you conceal information, then of course, there are, can be serious consequences, including cancellation of EIA, etc. Uh, amendments are possible unless you shift the project site itself. Uh, but if there is a change of sequence of operation or change of mere configuration or change of irrigation technology, not having too many, then of course, you don't need to go for amendment. Now, this is where there's a little bit of a problem because modernization and change of all this could be conflicting. One needs to look into that. Then there's a concept of validity. Again, there are three phases, 50 years for mining, 15 years for nuclear projects, river valley irrigation, and for all other projects, there are 10 years. Then for the operational phase, it's again 50 years, et cetera. But for the closure and the dismantling phase, there is absolute silence. So I think there's also an important element here that when a project gets ended, including mining, et cetera, what is that time period of closure uh, or, or uh, you know, this has been a huge issue for mining projects in coal area, especially that if you've finished your mining, etc., how do you come back to your reclamation plan? What will be the time period? And there are huge debates on this. And I think this needs real uh, flagging of, uh, at least in my view, it's important. Then comes monitoring. Uh, information has to be there on the newspaper, etc. Uh, now, very interestingly, the submission of the compliance report, which was six monthly, now has become yearly. I don't know the rationale for it. I think six monthly made the industries far more uh, uh, alert because they could examine themselves midway and then go back. So I think we need to get back to half yearly instead of yearly. Uh, but now there's an interesting penal provision of not submitting. There are monies uh, uh, you know, that will be charged if you don't submit it. Uh, and then there's a a very interesting compliance monitoring responsibility, which has been now according to the regional offices, etc., which is already there, uh, but now this is part of the law. Now, what is important here is that uh, now there's a recent uh, ministry letter that I remember, 8th of May, where a lot of these regional offices are being clubbed into one. So whether they will have the capacity to monitor these kind of projects is something that needs to be uh, looked into. There's also another provision of... Uh, uh, making other government institutions of national repute uh, who can be empaneled for random monitoring. Again, we need to understand what this really means uh, and who will actually do it. 
And if you look at the baseline, it is the same EIA report and the condition terms and the priority C, which is supposed to be the baseline for uh, compliance monitoring. Then, of course, uh, transferability is allowed uh, for specific projects. But very interestingly, uh, I want to spend a couple of minutes on violations. Uh, there is, if you look at an entire chapter of violations, and there's been a lot of debate, including in the courtrooms, you'll find that there's a new framework of post facto clearance now, which is in place. Now we can keep debating ad nauseum whether we need to have this or not. Uh, but what is important is uh, how are we going to do it? And the mechanism that has been laid out, I think there are some serious uh, issues uh, with that mechanism, not just from the cognizance standpoint, but also from the citizens' participation standpoint. Now, there is no space for a citizen to actually go and complain and say, okay, this fellow has been violating and cognizance can be taken, uh, which is totally unlike the principle uh, which is envisioned in the Environment Protection Act itself, where you can give a notice to a, you know, uh, for cognizance in a courtroom. But for some reason, the role of citizen has been excluded here. I think it should be there. Uh, then uh, the Central Pollution Control Board has been made the primary authority for assessment of ecological damage. I think this is again debatable a bit because uh, it is not really falling from any law. And we need to look at that because there are other authorities which can also be equally uh, used for assessment of damage. Uh, for example, groundwater and central groundwater authority linkage. So those things need to be also looked at. Now, if you look at the framework, 1.5 times of ecological damage and economic loss. And if it is sewer motto, so if I am a violator, if I go to you, 1.5 times the ecological damage and the economic damage uh, benefit, and then I am on. Twice if it is uh, by the government uh, agency or if rejected in the appraisal process. And uh, then, of course, there's a sewer motto application fee. So in all, there is a there's a mechanism for dealing with violation. Now, the question I have very critically is, is this a recipe for violation in perpetuity? I think this is something that we need to ponder. Is it violative of the Madras High Court order, which actually says that this is only a one-time measure? So can we actually have a mechanism for perpetual uh, violation? And then you can keep detecting it you know, over the years. So this is something that needs to be looked at. Can we look at remediation first and then start the EC process? This is something that needs to be pondered. What about actual performance guarantee for remediation? I don't think it's really out there. Uh, then, uh, of course, CTO and the occupancy certificate have been made provisional in case violations are detected. This is, again, something that needs to be uh, looked into. Uh, dealing with not then. So there's one violation and then there's a whole chapter on non-compliance. And there's a lot of confusion because this non-compliance of conditions is very industry friendly. There are hardly any legal consequences. It's largely pecuniary. If you give a bank guarantee and do a time-bound action plan, then you are through. I think there's, a, there's something that needs to be added more here in terms of liability uh, as far as industries are concerned. Uh, then, of course, there's a district survey report. I'm going to skip this very quickly. And there's an appellate provision, and I have a small point here, that can a subordinate legislation have an appellate provision uh, dehorse the law itself? If you look at the appellate powers, they are largely in the Environment Protection Act and the National Green Tribunal Act. Now, a subordinate legislation, in my little understanding, there are a lot of uh, legal luminaries uh, who are listening to me. Uh, they can uh, advise me and, and tell me, uh, guide me. That can a subordinate legislation actually replace the domain of the primary statute? I think there's some question that is largely legal. We need to really understand this. Uh, then, of course, there's a whole list of exemptions. And there are uh, 40 of them now. Earlier, there were very little. And I think there are some issues here in terms of, for example, uh, activity declared by state government under a legislation uh, and rules as non-mining activity will be exempted. Now, I know that there are states which have gone and said that if you want to dredge a particular river or you want to take out some uh, sand from there, it is not mining because I'm not charging any fee legally on paper. But then lots of money sort of go on the side. So I think there are issues here, including uh, solar projects. Assumption is that it's all very clean. Uh, then this entire uh, Projects which are not covered in the schedule, but if they are proposed in the notified industrial estate, then don't they don't require 
So I think these these are something that needs to be really looked into. Many projects, at least, I have not understood uh, whether uh, scientifically whether they have environmental impacts or not. So I think those needs to be also uh, seen. Uh, then, of course, there's a mechanism of what happens after the notification comes in and what's the role of the AI notification. I don't want to spend time there. But I just want to end my presentation with some of the broad concerns. First of all, I think it's time to make a law and not just a statutory notification that you can tweak as many times as you want. I think it's time to have a definitive law, number one. Secondly, if you look at a trend analysis, you will really understand the powers, uh, you know, the power play or the power that are at play. It's really interesting how exemptions are given. I think we need to really look into it. So the point I'm making is that EIA as a process, as a framework has reached some maturity in 26 years, for God's sake. It has to become a proper law and not just a subordinate legislation. Uh, and my last slide is, uh, as I said, categorization has to be revisited. There is no concept, and I want to again thank Ajay uh, Deshpande ji for, for his uh, inputs here from IIT Mumbai, uh, that the whole concept of cumulative impact assessment or social impact assessment or strategic environment assessment, these are now world over concepts. I think it's time to have it uh, in our framework. What about the capacity of the institutions themselves who are taking decisions? Their own augmentation, their own facilitation, their own resources, I have been a member of SIA of Arunachal for two terms. We didn't even have an office with no office, no support, nothing. So what kind of institutions are we creating? Is there a capacity to take those decisions? Again, is very important. Now, this latest merging of regional offices uh, of the letter that I mentioned earlier, again, we need to look at whether they have the capacity to monitor or not. And then a very important element, which I think should have been done before the notification, is a proper performance evaluation of the EIA 2006 itself. How has it actually functioned? And only then, based on the findings, you need to have. And I'm not, uh, I'm just saying that this, that process has to be done uh, much before this draft notification. Thank you very much for your time and your patience. And I don't know how to take the questions, but uh, I'm all there. Uh, for any questions that may be asked. I don't know how much time we have, but at least five to 10 minutes. Okay, so uh, how are you gonna do the question answer? Uh, can I hear someone or? I see a lot of uh, familiar faces and namaskar to all of you. Again, any questions that- Sir, from your request you to check your email. You have your questions in that mailbox. Okay. So I'm told that my email box has a question. What's your email ID? Uh, Sanjay at sanjayatldfindia.com. Uh, there are a few questions in the uh, chat box also, sir. Okay. All of them have been compiled. A question uh, from, uh, am I muted? Ah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. So from Vasudev, I have a question. Uh, will the COVID-19 situation dilute the EIA framework implementation while the states would like to make development projects on fast track? Um, I hope not. I mean, I don't see, in fact, COVID has given us a great example of how if you don't mess with the environment uh, can be actually, you know, you can see the results. So there will be, uh, of course, serious onslaught in my understanding. But I think what is important here is that uh, uh, if you look at the COVID situation and the impact on the environment today, I think this is a great time to have a baseline for our rivers, our forests, our land, because there has been least impact in these 50 odd days. And I think this could be actually an opportunity for most of the regulators to look into uh, the, the, the baselines before it is impacted. So yes, there will be a lot of pressure, but I think we need to be really careful here. 
in my understanding uh there is another question uh, what is the role uh, from asha ramesh what is the role of gram sabha in eia as most of these projects do come as a prio so at the moment uh, the role of the gram sabha has not been delineated the way i understand it uh, if the public consultation process uh, they are supposed to be part of it they have they have to be integral and i i know from where this is coming especially when you look at concepts of scheduled areas etc the role of the gram sabha really becomes important so at the moment it is not mentioned as clearly then which are the key areas where there is no link there is a uh, mr bansal from uh, adg forest he has a question eia is seen as a speed breaker in the way of ease of doing business so at every opportunity the process is being diluted what is the way out the land leveling should be taken as construction activity if the ec is not given the results is waste of time etc otherwise it will be taken as leverage so sir i think uh, what should be done i think this is precisely why we have gathered here sir that uh, if uh, eia should not be taken as a speed breaker i think if you look at the larger under uh, concept of eia it is for all of us i mean if there is an impact it has to be mitigated it has to be managed and so eia cannot be taken as a speed breaker as a matter of principle i think this notion of ease of business as opposed to eia is largely because of the manner in which eia is done and not because of the concept of eia itself in my humble understanding so i think if the framework is easy if the framework is real if it is transparent in the real sense then i don't think it should be seen as a speed breaker and it is not as a matter of principle uh sir so uh, can i uh, i am dr somnath from kolkata uh, uh sir i just want to ask you in if you look, look into the, my video is not on uh, but i the major major ia report if you look into there is basically cut and paste and basically uh, if you look into that those who are which are in the domain uh, that these are basically some data which are irrelevant and sometimes gives nothing like that okay you have to do some uh, some flora some fauna and all this kind of things and there is no checking on the part of cia or uh, ec or something like that is there any remedy from that no so if you look at the new notification the quality of that ei report uh, the responsibility of the accredited consultant and the functional uh, functional area expert has been delineated now and if they if the quality is of a suspect then they are responsible and they can be blacklisted i think i think uh, as a matter of practice these things are done but they are probably not known in the public domain as much as it probably should uh, so obviously nobody is going to accept a, 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 a low quality eia and and those people who are responsible needs to be taken to task and their accountability is as much i mean i remember in one of the cases uh, they found a, they found a cheetah in telangana for example in the eia report and i was very happy actually as a environment place that you know cheetahs got they were they were extinct in 1947 but we have found it suddenly in telangana but the fact was it was a typo according to them later on so yeah i think the quality of ei report is a serious issue and we need to really hold the people who prepare this uh, i have seen so many consultants coming to me and saying that oh we had only so much of resources we could not do a real comprehensive study so i think this whole thing of project driven and project proponent funded eia consultant i think that linkage is the real problem uh, i think it's high time that we have independent agencies who are who have no stake in the project who have no stake in the uh, success of the project they have to evaluate it independently uh, through technical competence i think that's the way out uh, uh. Okay, hello mr sanjay yes uh if nobody is going sorry i missed that can you can you can you tell your name so that uh, my team can uh, unmute you sir no 
Mr. Um, Padhya, can you uh, hear me? I want to raise a question. Who told Tolia? Yes, yes, Mr. Shivasta, but I. Yeah. Who told you? Can I go ahead? There is a question. Because uh, I, uh, I, I just sent uh, my question. Uh, during COVID-19 or post-19 uh, COVID-19, uh, there is a lot of emphasis that we have to reprioritize our lifestyles. We have go to uh, sustainable management of natural resources, and then uh, uh, all kinds of uh, climate change uh, mitigation, uh, control of deforestation, everything. But how do you see that this uh, new draft EIA notification will facilitate the conservation challenges that we see post COVID-19? Sir, I, I in fact just answered that question before this, that I think we need to take the, 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 the example or the, re, or the impact of the COVID today and in fact a positive impact on environment as a baseline. I think this is an opportunity to set good baselines uh, so that we can actually see the contributory impacts of other projects or, 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 or industries uh, which actually impact whether it's water quality, forest quality or land quality. This is a good time to assess baselines. Uh, and I think I need, we need to take COVID-19 as an opportunity rather than seeing it as an onslaught later. Sanjay Bhai, this is Ajay Khera. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, Sanjay Bhai, two questions, uh, quick ones. Uh, with the emphasis now on the geopolitical grounds uh, that people should be exiting China, most of them, the international is the same and uh, India marketing themselves in a big way to seek their assistance to come to India, number one, and two, the latest announcement made today by the finance minister, wherein she says that coal mining is now going to be, the government is going to come out of coal mining and commercial industry will be coming in. Now, these two things, how do you visualize in coming times that uh, they will be uh, having an impact on the EIA studies? Will it be more commercialization of the fact which is going on where, or will EIA be making some really leave into that see i see any business opportunity even if it is at the uh, sort of tragic outcome of uh, covid i see any business opportunity coming to india as as uh, as something positive and if we have a good framework if we have a, a solid framework which is which is robust which is easily understood which is simple enough uh, to take care of the the real issues of environment and the people's livelihood at large, then I think it's all welcome. So I look at it as an opportunity, not as any huge onslaught that we may, be, even if you're marketing and there will be a commercial uh, in, uh, inflow of commercialization. I mean, everybody's hoping that the economic will, economy will boom on that. I think we need to have the framework. We have to be prepared. And I think this is what this exercise is all about. How prepared are we to look at any investment which is I, because I know that many people are going to come and look at only a business opportunity and not necessarily an environmental responsibility. But all these concept of corporate environmental responsibility should not remain as a lip service anymore. It has to become more serious in terms of its implementation. I think that's the real challenge. Yeah. Hi. Uh, is it Sarang? Can I ask a quick question? Uh, hello. No, actually. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Uh, sir, can I ask another? Hello, can I can I yeah. can I ask one question, sir? See, there are a lot of people who have written something, so it might be a little unfair to them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I had seen request... Mr. Rohit had asked a question, and he's also raised yeah. his hand. Yeah. Uh, yes, can I come in now? I, please, uh, yeah. Please, please. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Rohit. I'm Rohit from Paryavaran Sutra Samiti. See the SAPI report of 2009, SAPI report of 2011, 13, and now recently of 2018 says practically that the past EIA are under questions because past EIA said all is well. I'm really worried that keeping in that mind, this EIA notification would have considered those points and try to plug many issues which are there in 2006. Why this are not discussed and mentioned at all? I had seen the uh, uh, little bit the uh, 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 minutes of it where some discussion happened where these reports are ignored. I am really surprised about that. I think that's a fair point you make, Rohit, uh, because uh, SEPI is a great example of how we have not performed very well. 
and all the uh, and the kind of uh, you know litigation that has happened and you've been so active uh, i think we really need to take uh, the causality and this is where i think the real challenge is and i think this is an opportunity that what are we talking about in terms of contributory impacts and uh, when we talk about source app apportionment in air quality etc then are we really making a clear distinction between which sector or sub sector is contributing to what number one and then if a categorization of uh, or, or, or and this is the whole concept of cumulative impact that with these kind of projects what has been the cumulative impact in a particular area or a, or or a region and unless we do that we can't keep allowing the way uh, it it cannot be business as usual so i take your point that that needs to be really seriously looked at sir uh, all right uh, thank you guys um, i think i'll have to intervene right now uh, so we are about time and uh, i would like to thank all the participants in the webinar all the senior people all the different representatives i'm sure we have set the right tone uh, for the uh, ei uh, you know we we are right now in a better position to shape our uh, suggestions and comments to the ei draft um, i would like to thank mr sanjay upadhyay and the eldf team also the team of news foundation who has worked to put this together uh, for any questions that have been unanswered uh, we have taken this transcript from the chat box and we will be replying to them over the email you can always reach out to news foundation or eldf for any questions uh, in the future so this thank you everyone uh, do you want to give a closing uh, uh, sir i just want to thank uh, each and every one i see so many of my seniors and uh, well wishers out there i really want to thank each and every one of you uh, i hope uh, there was some insight uh, uh, it is a work in progress uh, i want to thank my own team which has been working uh, with me on this uh, uh, and and i hope that we take these uh, joint understanding and common understanding to the people who matter there are many people uh, in in this audience today distinguished audience today who actually have more ear than i do and i'm going to request them to put a lot of these concerns out there so that we can make ultimately a robust instrument which is good for the environment good for the people of this country thank you so much everyone